Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, once again, we come before your sacred word, utterly dependent upon the grace of your Holy Spirit to become your interpreter. Speak to us your sacred word beyond the sacred page that it might well up in us to be the very heart and mind of Jesus Christ, who humbled himself in love to wash the feet of the disciples, and who calls us to love as he has loved. Empower us by your word spoken to us this day, that we may go forth into the world as the embodiment of your love, so that all might know the living presence of Jesus Christ in us. May we, as the heart and mind of Christ, be the compassion, the servant-oriented love for one another, as he was for us and is for us this day by your Spirit. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. In this passage, it, uh, it lands right in the middle of Jesus' uh, supper with his disciples, the very last supper he will eat with his disciples. In the opening of chapter 13, Jesus does not institute the Lord's Supper as we see what we traditionally, that, that, uh, that covenant, that, that commandment, that, that uh, uh, sacrament that we recognize as the Lord's Supper. He doesn't institute that here in John's Gospel as he does in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. No, instead, he, uh, he institutes some new kind of covenant, if you will, in the washing of the disciples' feet. He goes about washing the disciples' feet, all of them. Even Judas, as well as Peter, he washes their feet as a sign of servant-oriented love, the kind of love that God has for this sinful and broken world. Jesus washes the feet of the disciples as an act of love and then is going to require the disciples to love in the same way that he does. In so doing, he is establishing a new kind of covenant with us, similar to the covenant of the Last Supper, which he establishes in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But here, we're going to see that Jesus recognizes that he is going to be glorified by the one who would betray him. In fact, he uses that word glorify five times in this passage. And uh, the, the, the Greek word doxazo uh, is, uh, uh, we translate it as glorify, but it also means to lift up. And so it's, a, it's an interesting play on words that, that Judas, who goes to hand him over, is handing him over for glorification. Handing him over for Jesus, that glorification is his being lifted up. Lifted up for execution on the cross. Lifted up from the grave in the resurrection. Lifted up from the earth in his ascension. Jesus is glorified by the act of Judas's betrayal. Which is where this story picks up. Is where Judas leaves the room to go and hand Jesus over. Listen for the word of God. When he had gone out, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. An amazing passage, my Christian friends. How odd that Jesus is having this meal with his disciples, but... This being the Last Supper, he does not here in John's Gospel institute the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. He, inst he institutes something that becomes a kind of new sacrament, if you will, a commandment to love one another. 
When we read this, we need to remember that John, who is writing this gospel, is inviting his initial readers to look at this commandment to love one another with fresh eyes. And he's inviting you and me to do it, too, because I, I submit to you, we do not fully understand the import of this commandment to love one another as we ought to. This commandment is the hallmark of discipleship. Jesus is telling us that this is what it means to show the world that we are disciples. How does the world know who we are? By our love for one another, he is saying. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples. By this, the world will know that Jesus Christ is the loving, risen Lord, because they will see Christ in us. They will see Christ in our love. They will see Christ in our self-sacrifice for one another. Just as the Lord's Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is the mark of the new covenant, here in John, the mark of the new covenant is our love for one another. Our ability to love one another is just as important as this, and just as sacred as celebrating the Lord's Supper. But the radical nature of this commandment to love one another is often missed, I, I submit to you. I think we dismiss it outright because we think it's too easy, my Christian friends. We shouldn't. We dismiss it. We dismiss this ethical demand focusing on love among members because we think it is just uh, too, too pedestrian, too easy to do. Of course, if we join the community of faith, of course, if we're disciples of Jesus Christ, we expect that we are family, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We expect that we're going to love one another, right? Jesus doesn't need to bother commanding us to love, <coughs> to love one another because we already do, right? We dismiss the easiness of it and we soften the ethical demand of it because we think that the, the love of people outside the church is much harder. Jesus commands us to love our neighbors. Well, those neighbors may or may not be Christian. That kind of love might be a little bit harder. Even harder than that, we think, is to love our enemies. He tells us to love our enemies. But loving within the church, an internal love, loving the community, loving our fellow disciples, loving one another, seems easier compared to loving our neighbors or loving our enemies. That's how we think. That this commandment is directed internally does not make it easier, I submit to you, my Christian friends. It's not easier to keep. It is no easy task for Christians to love one another. Take a look at Judas. Take a look at Peter. Look at that spectrum of disciples right within that same area of dinner. Who's doing the act of love? How do we love Judas? And I would submit to you, how would we even love Peter? Because I'm, I'm going to show you Peter in some ways is not too much better than Judas. Because Peter himself doesn't understand what Jesus means when he commands to love one another. I mean, think about it. When Jesus is exemplifying what that love is by going about washing the disciples' feet, Peter protests. Peter is not willing to acknowledge that someone in a position of authority should humble themselves lovingly for another. He's embarrassed to have Jesus wash his feet because a master doesn't do that for a disciple. Jesus has to correct Peter to show him this is what it means to follow him. Notice also later on in the, in the verses which are going to follow here. When Jesus says that he is going somewhere that they cannot follow, Peter says, I'll follow you anywhere. I'll give my life for you, he says, in the, in the subsequent verses that follow here. And it's at that point that Jesus says, really, Peter, you'll follow me anywhere. You'll give your life for me. I tell you, before this night's out, you will deny me three times. Those are the following verses that we did not read in this passage. Judas, Peter, what wonderful examples of love they are, my Christian friends. Right there is an example of how difficult it may be within the community to love. In many ways, it is easier for us to love our enemies because we don't have daily dealings with our enemies. I don't. It's easy for me to say, I love my enemies. I don't have to deal with them on a regular basis. But a review of church history in any era will reveal just how difficult this commandment to love one another is. In the lives of the disciples right there in that room, 
And subsequently, throughout Christian history, Christians have had a difficult time acting in love. Every age of Christianity, we've had our difficulty loving one another in the church. We think it's easy to love the people in the pew with us, but when we're sitting right next to them, when we're in education classes with them, or at family dinners, there's always conflict, my Christian friends. That's what family is. And many times, all too often, we let that conflict stand in the way of our love. The conflict is natural. It's what life is. We always live in conflict with one another because we all have our different understandings of what God requires us to do. We have different understandings of what is right and wrong. We're constantly in conflict with one another. But what happens is we Christians allow that natural conflict, which can be strength-giving, to divide us, to polarize us, to drive us apart, to cause us not to act in sacrificial love for one another. No, my Christian friends, it's okay to be in conflict with your fellow Christians, to disagree with them. We still must love one another. So that commandment to love one another is not as easy as I think people think. That the commandment directed internally, not outside to our neighbors or our enemies, but directed internally to one another, doesn't make it any easier. Jesus affirms that the community's love for one another would be assigned to the world. If we will love one another, the world will know that we are disciples. If we want the world to know the love of God that is stated in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he sent his son into the world. If we want the world to know this, we've got to show the world that love. How? By loving one another in the same manner that Christ loved us, in washing our feet, in, in serving us, in sacrificing for us. That's how the world will know who Jesus Christ is. That's how the world will know that God so loves the world. By our ability to love one another. But the sign is crippled all too often. That sign is crippled daily by division and discord within the Christian community. When we act in ways that do not reveal our mutual love for one another, my Christian friends. How in the world can we expect the world to know the love of Jesus Christ when we can't practice that love even within the walls of our, of our own community. The church's witness to the world is always hurt, always diminished by hatred and lack of love among our fellow Christians. Why would the world, I'm serious, ask yourself this question, my Christian friends, why would the world come to God if the church is a loveless environment. Why would they come to God if the church is as loveless as the world in which the world lives? There's no reason for the world, for the, for the people of the world to leave the world and come and be the church with us if all they see in us is the same lovelessness that they see in the world. They can get that in the world. Why would they want to come and be a part of us if we cannot love one another? As Christ so loves us. As Christ commands us. What is also interesting in this, my Christian friends, is that Jesus says that this is a new commandment. That's interesting. In verse 34, he says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. And I, I ponder this, a new commandment. Wait a minute. What is new about love? He's been telling us all along that we are to love our enemies. He's been telling us all along that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, that we are to love God with all of our being. What's new about love? In fact, Jesus, when he tells us to love our neighbors, when he tells us to love God, all he's doing is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, or Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. The, the commandment to love is as old as the Old Testament. What's new about love? The newness doesn't reside in the love, my Christian friends. The newness resides in making a new covenant, a new relationship, a new agreement that this is who we are going to be in Jesus Christ, that the world will know that Christ is alive in us, that the love that God has for this world continues through us. That's what's new. Of course we're supposed to love our neighbors. Of course we're supposed to love God. What we're really supposed to do that's new 
is to make that love known in sacrificing for the world and for one another, just as Christ has done for us. Just as God, who did not love from a distance, loved this world so much that he entered this world, that he punched a hole into this world, that the Creator joined with his creation in order to make his love known. God becomes a servant for us because God so loves this world. Christ becomes a servant for us because that's what love does. And we are to serve one another in love because we are disciples. And by this, this new act, the world will know that we are disciples. To love one another is an integral part of making Christ's love known. Just as, just as sacred as the Lord's Supper is to us, so loving one another should be just as sacred, just as sacramental, just as holy. Like the Lord's Supper, to, make one, to, make, uh, to love one another is our fresh signature in the, in, in the covenant. My Christian friends, that's what's new. We are empowered by God in our acts, our sacred acts, our holy acts, our covenantal acts of loving one another. That the world will know that Christ lives, that Christ loves. I charge you, my Christian friends, for the sake of the world and for the love of God, love one another. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name.
with one voice reaffirm our Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. My Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the meal that you celebrated with your disciples and for the newness of that covenant which comes not only in the breaking of bread and the sharing of a cup, but in the new commandment to love one another. Even as history has shown from the beginning of your disciples all throughout the history of your church that we have been in conflict and struggle with one another may we rise up so that the world might see the love that you have exemplified for us in the washing of the disciples feet in the giving of your life in your glorification and your being lifted up on the cross as a sacrificial offering for us may the world know your love your sacrificial love through our acts of love and compassion, of sacrifice and service for one another. Teach us by your spirit, my, by the example that Christ has given us, that we can love one another and therefore that we can love the world as you have loved the world. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. He who taught us to pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 